PlayStation 2, home to many great games like God Hand, Glass Rose, and of course Alone in the Dark 2008. I've always loved this thing, even if the controller feels like it could crumble in my hands at any moment. Having already made one grab back for both the PSP and the Nintendo DS, I thought to myself, why not do the same thing for literally the best selling console of all time. Originally I intended to put like 10 games in the video, but after randomly selecting them I realized that it's gonna be a bit too many for just one video, so I chose 6 of them and left the rest for another time. Don't worry Dog Island fans, you'll get your time in the spotlight next time. I have no idea how to start videos so I'll just get into it. Let's start off with a strong one. Chain Dive is extremely fucking cool. It was one of the first games ever developed by Alveon. The name might not ring a bell directly, but they've actually helped out in developing a lot of different games, including several Platinum Games titles, the Siren series, and that one Splatoon 2 DLC my friends won't stop talking about. Unfortunately, their own library never really took off in the same vein. Anyway, back to Chain Dive. This game was published by Sony themselves. And back in 2003, that shit meant something. Right off the bat, easily the highlight of this entire game is the soundtrack. This shit is fantastic, and I've used it in several videos before. There were two composers working on the game. One of them being Hideyuki Eto, who also worked on some of the best Armored Core soundtracks, including Formula, Front, Nine Breaker, and Four. The rest of the soundtrack, however, was composed by Yuji Takenuchi, who also goes by Takenouchi. Whilst he has worked on some pretty noteworthy titles, such as Metal Gear 2, Dark Souls 1, and Project X Zone 2, that isn't why I'm pointing it out in particular. Because because you see, back in 2017, more than a decade after the game's original release and commercial failure, Takenouichi released an album on his bandcamp in which he rearranged every single song he composed for Chain Dive. This is because he still considers this his most personal project to date. These arrangements are excellent and I highly recommend giving them a listen. Link in the description as always. That said, I stalled enough time, let's talk about the game. Visually speaking, Chain Dive falls into this neat and honestly underutilized subgenre of 2.5D side scrollers. If you've played something like Klonoa or Little Big Planet, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. But essentially, the game takes place on a two dimensional plane with a three dimensional environment. Thanks to this, the game is able to utilize the positioning of the camera to greatly enhance the scope of a stage outside of the playing field. In this game, it results in a look reminiscent of a grittier Nights into Dreams. I love this, and I believe it perfectly complements the aesthetic of a game like this. In terms of gameplay, the easy comparison to make would obviously be something like Bionic Commando, but I feel like it does the game a disservice. It's just about the only similarities they share are the fact that the protagonist swings around the stage a lot. Every stage is littered with these grapple points onto which you can latch on. With them, you can swing around like a Spider-Man game or quickly launch into yourself in the air. The physics feel fantastic and it is honestly just fun in and of itself to swing around. This is good as your moveset is pretty damn limited. All you have is to grapple an attack, a screen nuke, and a double jump. Attacking an enemy freezes them, allowing you to grapple onto them directly, which is what actually enables you to defeat them. Doing so heals you up a bit, and the longer the chain of kills, the more health you restore, so it's greatly incentivized to chain as many kills together as you can. This is further emphasized by the fact that the screen nuke actually damages you, so it has certain risk or reward factor to it. The game also does something that I really love about Zone of the Enders too, it never stagnates. Every other level or so features a unique set piece or mechanic to break up the usual gameplay, like making you defend an airship, having a Crash Bandicoot style escape sequence or making you snowboard down a mountain. And while I can't say that all of these levels are created equal, shoutouts to whoever designed the airship level especially, I will get my revenge. Most of them are short enough to not break the pace of the game. The story is easily, well, is the weakest part of the game. The setting is extremely cool, but the actual narrative is just kinda whatever. Not bad, mind you, but just kinda there. That's not necessarily a bad thing, though. I actually think having a simple story to go along with the game helps maintain a clear focus, and it's not like these kinds of games even need some well-written epic to go along with them, so I'm glad they at least try to have one. All around, I had a fantastic time playing Chain Dive, and if there's even a single thing you should take away from this video, it's that you really should play this game. And now for something significantly less exciting. This is Homura. It's a shoot 'em up developed by a small Korean developer called Skonek. However, nowadays they're focused primarily on VR stuff and marketing themselves as having commercialized the world's first VR gun shooting game. By which I can only assume that they mean their commercial and critical flop, Mortal Blitz. Before all this though, they were primarily busy making shmups, such as Psy VR and Castle of Shigigami 3. I tried looking around and the only site I was able to find with information on this game's release was Moby Games, and that site claims that Tomura was only ever released in the UK and Japan. This seemed weird to me, since even though this was published by Taito, a Japanese company, 
it was still developed by Koreans. So I was sure a Korean version existed somewhere. In the process of looking into info for this, I stumbled onto a Korean wiki page that automatically translated itself into English and led me down the rabbit hole of homosexuals by type and country. I ended up losing my shit over this for like half an hour and that is not an exaggeration. Anyway, that's for later, right now is game time, I think. And as I said, this is a shmup with a feudal Japanese setting. That's about the most interesting thing it has going for itself, truth be told. I'm really not big into shoot em ups, but this seems like a perfectly fine one. What I do find interesting, however, is that you have a melee move that can deflect incoming shots, and as someone who fucking sucks at these kinds of games, I didn't get much use out of it. But I can imagine that fans of the genre would have a pretty good time with it, as you can actively choose between levels and paths that vary progression, which I'm sure adds a bit of replayability as well. Alright, I've gotta come clean. This one didn't get picked randomly at all. I just have to talk about it because the stars must have aligned or some shit. The Simple Series Volume 105 made uniform and machine gun. I've already talked about the Simple Series in prior grab bag videos, so you can just watch those if you don't know what that is. But for now, I'll just go ahead and talk about the game itself. You see, for whatever otherworldly reason, this game recently got a fan translation. To me, this is a big deal, because for like a year now, whenever people asked me to show them a handful of weird games on the PS2, this was one of the first ones I watched. I don't really know why I did that, but I certainly did. Maybe it's just that the concept is that ridiculous. Gameplay-wise, this is a third-person beat-em-up, but an incredibly stiff one. You have a large arsenal of weapons, of which you can equip whichever you want between stages, but your main arsenal consists of a machine gun, a sniper rifle, and a katana. The attacks feel extremely unresponsive and clunky, especially the melee ones. Because the way they work is that you get a basic free hit combo, but to use it you need to stand perfectly still, and it just feels really weird to do. At one point you're also thrust into a stage where you have to snipe cars from a window, and it's terrible and feels like it goes on for way longer than it should. Sugunai Atonement is one of the most creative RPGs I've played in quite a while. It was developed by a studio named Cattle Call. They actually have quite an interesting history and I do want to talk about it. However, if you don't care about it, skip to this timestamp to get to the part where I actually talk about the game itself. So, Cattle Call. It's a studio consisting of former Data East developers. I've talked about them before, but they made a bunch of shit including like Joe and Mac, Metal Mac, Story of Heracles. They ended up going bankrupt in 2003, to which Powon bought most of the rights to their IPs. G Mode ended up buying the rest uh, in like 2004. And this is where things start getting really fucking stupid. Because, so, Powell bought Glory of Heracles, however, they ended up giving partial ownership to the franchise to Nintendo, which is how we ended up getting a fifth game on the DS, but also killed the series. Metal Max, on the other hand, was purchased by Kettle Call. Uh, however, because of fucky bullshit going on with the ownership rights of the series, the IP ended up belonging to Kadokawa Games instead, who would end up having Kettle Call develop a remake of Metal Max 2, as well as making a third and fourth main game. However, 4 was actually developed by a company named 24 Frame, who made the last proper game in the franchise to be released, a weird PC spin-off named Metal Dogs, which actually came out back in 2021. They also announced two more Metal Max games, but both of those ended up getting cancelled shortly after the announcement because Sai Games ended up buying the IP back in July of 2022. Um, that, that, that's like insane to me because literally just a month earlier, Katakawa Games released a remaster of Metal Max Xeno. And all while this bullshit is going on, Arc System Works like ended up getting the rights to fucking Jake Hunter. Uh, I don't I don't know how that happened, but anyway, Catalcon ended up just getting fed up with all of this bullshit and they decided to just make original IPs. And one of those, for instance, would be Alliance Alive. Number one is this game. Um, so let me go back to talking about it, I guess. Now I know this technically has nothing to do with the game itself, but holy shit, the box that is so hilariously ugly, I can't even tell what I'm looking at half the time. I guess you could group this together with like, Western covers of Silent Hill 1 or the original Project Zero that use a bunch of weird ass CG imagery that doesn't even make any fucking sense. But once inside the game though, something that immediately caught me off guard was how good the music was. And after some digging, it turns out the composer was none other than Yasunari Mitsuda himself, a real legend in the industry, having worked on shit like Xenogears, Chrono Trigger, and Shadow Hearts. Story-wise, he plays a mercenary who ends up being ordered to steal a very valuable treasure, which causes a god to get so pissed he removes your soul from your body. The only way you'll be allowed to reclaim your body is by helping out the local town folk with the problems. And this is where the gameplay kicks in. Instead of one grand overarching narrative, the story is split into several small-scale quests. 
Said quests usually involve you possessing the local townsfolk and then helping them out with their personal troubles. Sometimes this involves combat, sometimes a dungeon, and sometimes all you have to do is find a certain item and talk to the right people. Actually, let's talk about combat for a bit. You have two kinds of offensive maneuvers, a regular attack and a magic. To use a spell, you first need to find the corresponding gemstone, then insert it into your active magic stones. It's a pretty neat way of going about it if you ask me, as clever placement of gems allows you to maximize the amount of spells you have. Your defensive maneuvers are much more interesting, on the other hand. It's kind of reminiscent of a Mario RPG in that sense. Once being attacked, your face buttons correspond to four different actions, three guards and a dodge. Dodging completely negates any damage, however it depletes a bit of your meter which you can see on the lower right, whereas attacking and blocking recharges it. When your meter is full you can then spend it all to use a strage or strage or however the fuck it's pronounced attack. I don't fucking know. Basically, it's a big strong attack that makes enemies get hurtily much stronger bang bang, okay? Fundamentally, the comment is pretty solid. But man, the enemies are insanely spongy to a ridiculous degree, and everything feels so sluggish and slow, I guess. It isn't a deal breaker or anything, but it can definitely get noticeable. But at least the encounters aren't random, so you can run around them and avoid the enemies if you're good enough. At least you don't have to rebuy equipment every time you possess a new person, since that stuff carries over. Actually, now that I think about it, the entire story and game is just pretty slow paced. Fair enough, the game isn't particularly amazing when it comes to motivating factors like the story, but what I'm trying to get to is that it can get insanely draining when played for longer sessions at a time. Overall, the game is evidently a low budget labor of love, so expecting a masterpiece is asking too much, but for what it is, Tsuganai is a pretty damn enjoyable and chill experience. I'd recommend at least checking it out if this seems in any way interesting to you. Out of every game in this video, this is easily my favorite explicitly bad one. What we have here is quite possibly one of the worst FPS games I have ever played. The rest behind it, Atomic Planet, have never had much luck when it comes to making good games, you see. Their most famous work is Jackie Chan Adventures on the PS2. And other than that, it's just ports, like the GBA version of Puzzle Fighter 2 and the Mega Man Anniversary Collection. You'd expect at least a shred of originality out of this game, right? But nope, nothing is original here. For one, the game rips off the 2004 Van Helsing movie so blatantly that it really wouldn't be surprising if you saw them get sued over it. However, back when I first discovered the game, I did a little research on it and stumbled onto some weird now discontinued website that had a listing for the game and it claimed that the title screen theme was stolen from a game called Painkiller. Now, I've gone through what I assume to be most of the Painkiller soundtrack and I cannot say that I was able to verify this. If any one of you can confirm this, please let me know because you cannot understand how much I want to be true. It would be so fucking funny. Uh, there actually exists a PC port of this game by the name of Chronicles of a Vampire Hunter, but I wasn't able to get my hands on it unfortunately. Surprisingly enough, this game also features widescreen support, which would be cool if the game wasn't uglier than the monitor of my ex. God, where do I even begin with this game? It's just so bad. Like, well for one, the voice acting is terrible, or at least it is whenever you can hear it because the sound mixing is so shit that it makes Sonic Adventure 2 look like a completely made game. Your weapons have about as much weight behind them as a feather, there's no proper feedback to hitting enemies and everything just feels so unnaturally light yet stiff at the same time, especially the melee attack. What doesn't help is that the level design is also fucking garbage. There's invisible walls everywhere, I can't even begin to explain how many times I'd end up going somewhere that looked accessible only to be stopped in my path by something that I can't fucking see. Whenever you you're not running against a wall, you're just thrust into some of the worst mazes I've ever seen. Just, ah, uh, they're awful. And don't even get me started on the stealth sections. Holy shit, they're so fucking bad. As soon as you get into an enemy's minor peripheral vision, game over. You have to start all the fucking way over. It's incredibly inconsistent and plays like utter dog shit. This is the kind of game you show to your friends to collectively laugh at how awful it is. And for that reason alone, I do not regret having played it because it really did get a bunch of laughs out of me and my friends and that all makes it worth it in my eyes. Before I move on to the last game on the list though, I'd like to give a special shout out to this Russian text review of the game I found, in which the reviewer calls the game so shit that he wouldn't even use it as a coffee cup coaster. Thank you, Comrade Foxy. As the last game for this list, we have another Korean made one. And honestly, much like with Homura, I'm really glad that I was able to find this. You see, in my experience, the Korean and Chinese game development scene is often overlooked. Usually, whenever people in the West think about games from those regions, it's always MOBAs or MMOs or something about the government. I don't know. And whilst those are abundant, I think it's a damn shame that they overshadow just about everything else that comes from over there. I can consider myself lucky to have stumbled onto several really good games from both of these regions, as well as other Asian game developers. For instance, China gave a series like Xuan Yuan Sword, 
and Legend of Sword and Fairy. Meanwhile, Korea gave us fantastic games like Library of Ruina and Sanabi the Revenant. Basically, what I'm getting at is that the prospect of a Korean survival horror game had me really excited. Uh, funnily enough, the developer, Nlog, which is short for New Leader of Game, has a PDF portfolio just casually lying around online. I can't say I've ever seen any other game that do that. And wouldn't you know it, their most successful game was in fact a weird MOBA MMO thingy that was actually released in the West. Uh, whilst looking into it, I ended up finding some really funny ads and gameplay videos from back in the day, and that shit oozes 2007 so much, I love it. I, I kind of want to show them off more, but uh, because they use like copyrighted music and shit, I can't, lest I get the video taken down. So I'll just be putting them in the description, they're so fucking funny. Anyway, for Mystic Knights, I ended up playing a fan translation, because I still cannot believe that that actually, like, that it got one. Um, and I also want to clarify that I won't be talking about the online mode, which does exist, uh, because I have no idea how to set that kind of shit up in 2023, especially because the official servers are long since dead. So, like I said earlier in the segment, this is a third-person survival horror game. However, unlike something like the Silent Hills or Resident Evil's of the time, you have full control over your camera, meaning no tank controls. But unfortunately, also no cool cinematic camera perspectives. Also, I guess you can consider this a warning, but uh, the enemies have a lot of, um, let's call it phallic designs. By that I mean that the zombie stand-ins have penises for heads and show their naked tits. And then there's whatever the fuck this is. There's generally like four or so enemy types and everything else is half-hearted or a recolor. So that's a shame. And since we're talking about the enemies, I may as well start talking about the gameplay because yeesh, it is rough. Aiming locks you into a strafe, which makes turning impossible, and that can get pretty irritating. This is especially annoying because most of your time in combat will be spent using melee weapons. Guns in general are always more of a last resort, and usually I would consider this a positive, but it's extremely easy to die from being stun locked when engaging in melee combat and avoiding enemies is generally kind of difficult because, well, everything is a tiny hallway. And also the enemies outpace you. And actually I have to give the game a bit of praise here, because whilst the load times, they may be really long, uh, there's only very few of them, mostly relegated to opening and closing the menu, like I said. Moving between the actual areas is completely uninterrupted, and for a low-budget PS2 game like this, that is damn impressive. Thankfully, the game always has a marker telling you where to go as well, and whilst it can be pretty damn handholdy at times, it greatly alleviates the frustration of running into a wrong room and getting molested by a shit ton of enemies who may just end up stunlocking you to death. Story-wise, the game may be weak and a bit silly and nonsensical at times, but it is damn ambitious, and it's clear that a lot of care went into it. All around, the game is goddamn stiff, but if you're a hardcore survival horror enjoyer, then there are definitely a lot of things to appreciate here. Just don't go into it expecting some obscure horror masterpiece or something. And that concludes tonight's grab bag. As usual, I believe that all of these games have some sort of value, and I do promise that the next batch will be just as interesting. Though that might not come for a while. I have something planned. Cheers, and do me a favor here. Have a fantastic morning, day, evening, or night. It feels good to finally finish a proper video again after two straight months of production issues, broken PC, what have you. But, I'm back. Uh, this is gonna be the only non-themed video for a bit, because for the next few months I'd like to focus on uh, a bit of something... Well, I want to do an all-inclusive retrospective of one of my favorite franchises of all time, A Perfect Works. Or I guess some people call it Xeno, if that's what you want to call it. Um, but I mean Xeno Gears, Xeno Saga, Xenoverse, Xenophobia, Xenoblade, what have you. Because uh, just the other day, as I'm recording, this. Uh, in fact, actually, like, earlier today, they released the DLC campaign of Xenoblade Chronicles 3, Future Redeemed, and that is supposed to, like, cap off the entire franchise under Tetsuya Takahashi's involvement. And because of that, I really want to talk about the games, because they mean a lot to me. Um, if I can, I'll put up multiple videos and multiple parts of the series uh, out in one month. If not, I'll attempt to, like, put out a smaller scale miscellaneous video in between, but I won't make any promises. The idea right now is that I'm gonna have, like, three parts for the series. Part one is gonna be just Xeno Gears and Perfect Works itself. Part two is gonna be about the entire Xeno Saga series. Part three is gonna be about everything from Xenoblade. Um, I expect parts two and three to be, like, extra huge, so I ask of you to bear with me. I usually don't like making, like, 40, 50 hour long videos, but, um, if that happens, then you can call me whatever the hell you want. Um, I'll keep things updated through the community tab, and, um, yeah, I hope you're looking forward to that as much as I'm looking forward to, like, work on that. So, uh, yeah, see ya.